This special presentation of Maryville Talks Books, Not So Late Night, is presented by Maryville University and Left Bank Books. With media sponsors, St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU, and HEC TV. Poetry has been described as a literary work in which special intensity is given to the expression of feelings and ideas by the use of distinctive style and rhythm. At its core, poets explore the world within and without, forging a connection with their readers and audiences. Music, it can be argued, is capable of being described in much the same way. Check, check, check. Not So Late Night was a collaboration of artists featuring the combination of poetry and music presented in front of a live audience at 2720 Cherokee Performing Arts Center. The featured poets include St. Louis native and host for the evening, Shiraz Gorman. Shiraz is a storyteller, poet, advertising creative, and author of In the Midst of Loving. Her poetry has been featured nationally, and she's appeared at TEDx Gateway Arch. My roots go pretty deep as far as poetry and the art scene here. I always knew that this city was filled with dope artists because back in 2000, I was a part of an arts collective called Soul Tide, um, where it was a group of musicians, poets, writers, painters, photographers. Um, and a lot of us actually are back home, <laughs> you know? A lot of us start relocating back to St. Louis around 2012, 2013, you know, older, wiser. I always knew that we were special. I'm just glad the, the world is finally seeing what we've always known. While doing research specifically regarding how violent crime affects siblings, I spoke with the head of victim services. A bit stumped by my inquiry, she said, you know what, I'm sorry. Also performing his work was Hanif Abdurraki. Hanif is a poet, writer, and cultural critic from Columbus, Ohio. He's the author of The Crown Ain't Worth Much, They Can't Kill Us Until They Kill Us, and the co-author of the chapbook, Vintage Sadness. Oh, I think the written word matters because it's a way of archiving the times we live in and the ways uh, we can build bridges towards people who are perhaps not like, like we are. I, mean, I do write about social issues. I, I, I tend to write a lot about, um, you know, race and uh, masculinity and trying to find ways to bridge gaps on those things. And, and uh, I write a lot about equity and ways to, to better serve the people I love and care about. The musical elements of this program were performed by Katara and the Soul Folks, a collaboration of St. Louis-born artists whose genres migrate through the musical spectrum. The music we make a great mixture of um, soul, R&B, hip hop, with some rock in it, because we gotta rock, we have to. <laughs> Just to be a part of the movement that's going on right now, um, it's, a, it's a cultural thing, and I feel like it's spiritual in a way too, because it's healing St. Louis, like in a way, telling, letting people in St. Louis know like the arts do matter. And the talents of these artists made for a special evening of their works. Sometimes combined, sometimes separate, but always true to the moment. Well, I hope the audience will find new ways to um, connect with each other and connect with the idea of, of genres blending together to um, fulfill a, a one message. For me, at least, the, the message is uh, connectivity and, and finding some joy in times that aren't entirely joyful. I'm going to read a, I'm gonna read a contrapuntal in the voice of Marvin Gaye's ghost. A contrapuntal, for those who don't know, is a poem that is in two sections. So like, there's a section here and a section here. And this section's a poem, this section's a poem, then it reads across as a poem. Is that cool? You'll figure it out. <laughs> the ghost of Marvin Gaye mistakes a record store for a graveyard. They burned the disco records. My mother's voice, or was it my mother's dresses, spun in front of a mirror. Memory is as fleeting as any other high, with the lights off or with the halo of lipstick staining the gospel. When my mother pushed a boy out to be given a father's violence, gaping in any bedroom like the small mouths of boys on Saturday mornings from the corners, how even a trick of the ears can turn a night. In London, they yelled Marvin, Marvin, 
Marvin, and I saw devils hanging. The ghost of Marvin gave mistakes a record store for a graveyard. And from the smoke, I heard that my father once wore the music he tried to pray out of himself. Never tell anyone you love them around the edges of a bedsheet. Or was it that my father simply loved his name in every reflection of myself? When the women called to me, the walls opened up bullet holes, trying to sing along to hymns of their mother's best dress. It is funny hearing a weapon. Marvin, 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 at the end of every curtain. Now I'm going to read the whole thing. The ghost of Marvin Gaye mistakes a record store for a graveyard. They burned the disco records, and from the smoke I heard my mother's voice. Or was it that my father once wore my mother's dresses and spun in front of a mirror to the music he tried to pray out of himself? Memory is as fleeting as any other high. Never tell anyone you love them with the lights off or with a halo of lipstick around the edges of a bedsheet staining the gospel. Or was it that my father simply loved when my mother pushed a boy out to be given his name in every reflection of myself, a father's violence gaping when the women called to me in any bedroom, the walls opened up bullet holes like the small mouths of boys trying to sing along to hymns on Saturday mornings from the corners of their mother's best dress. It is funny how even a trick of the ear Ears can turn hearing into a weapon. A night in London, they yelled, Marvin, 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 and I saw devils hanging at the end of every curtain. Hmm. Well, for me, when I gig with musicians, um, there's another element that's added to it. There's energy that's even pulled out of me and that I pull from the musician that sometimes does something to my work that I totally did not expect, you know, in, in a reading, in or a performance. This poem started in the middle of itself, like so many of us do. Rushed into me like rhythm, you know, the kind you learn early from mama's hums and dance routines. Mama's humming again, accompanied by a back and forth rocking motion, like she's having a concert with her emotions. Her mood is the color of night settling into itself black and blue, all over a lover who decided to imprint love across her face, eyes, braille, raised and hard to the touch. And I hear little girls speaking about the devil beating his wife when the sun is shining and the rain is coming down like this is something to be remembered for generations. From great grands to breast sprouting before season in this unnatural land where she learns early to use what she got to get what she wants passed down to her from women who heard the song and used the lyrics as filler for their self-esteem. Rolling on the river, she was black and blue once too. And I got conflicting feelings about Miles for what he did to Sicily. A love so supreme showed her how to love with a hard shell and a razor somewhere on her person, just in case a motherfucker tried to trip. Black and blue, rings of but this ain't satin. These are colors born from silence and women who tell themselves somehow they deserve the tap that drained their very soul. Try the new woman on tap. Drink up before there is nothing left. Women and girls dance in this wor man's world between any time, any place. And did he just take it? Where does a woman go to find peace? is solace found haphazardly, like finding that seasoning you were looking for for months on a shelf it should have been on in the first place. But you know where it is now, and that's good enough. But it's also old news, black and blue. We don't have to suffer the same fate, black, black, black woman, black girl. We don't have to be the training ground for misplaced anger masking itself as manhood. Blue girls criticized for rolling our eyes, curling our lips with, with words ready on our tongues, waiting for the hammer to drop. We don't have to be black and blue all the time. Can't we just be? We just truly just want to be. Yes, tears look sad, but are they really? I heard a woman once cured herself with her tears cried the sickness right onto some pillowcase she later dreamt on. And I'm having dreams of women and girls singing in the sunlight, minus the glasses shading their eyes, some humming, all dancing on solid ground to the beat of healthy hearts. You hear that? 
The silence is no longer a sad hiding place where insomnia-stricken souls go to dry heave their pain because someone left directions on the sun for us to reflect differently. Thank you. I literally am feeling what they are saying. So sometimes I had to do it so I'm not distracted <laughs> by what they're saying because you can get so caught up in the words and the beauty of what they're saying that, you know, even the musicians can get distracted because you'll get emotional. I can be up there crying and playing <laughs> at the same time. So that's how I like to um, do it as a musician is just allow their words to really get to my heart. And I will, I play exactly what I feel when I'm listening to them. Resistance of the instances of me and you. Cause time is just a distance when our conversations bloom. Incense lit this cannabis, it's night moonlit with affection. They submit at a will like how we feel when we make this love connect. Attracted to your strength, you appreciate my delicacy. With no intent, I can feel your face telling me, I, 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 I got to doubt you how I Yeah, I think poetry and music connect pretty easily. I, I think that, you know, the, the first um, poets were musicians and the first musicians were poets and it's, it's um, really connective, right? I think that poet, poetry is rhythmic and, and pulls a lot of its cues from, from sound uh, and that is really vital. Included in the evening's festivities, the audience was treated to insight on Hanif's life, process, and perspective. I grew up kind of um, in a neighborhood that was largely black, um, and then I played soccer in, in 
discover white people. Uh, I was like good enough at soccer to play for like select teams, like, and I was like, whoa. I grew up in a neighborhood that was kind of bordered by two suburbs, one a largely black suburb and one a largely white suburb. And um, yeah, I, I would often ride my bike to the edge of the border, in the white suburb, and not often cross over. Yeah, because that's one of the things that I really appreciate about your writing is that I get sucked into your life. Oh no. Yeah, no. you. <laughs> you <Sorry>. have yeah you have <laughs> you have a way of pulling the reader in in an emotional kind of way. Oh, I'm not sure why my writing speaks to so many people, but I do try to write in a way that uses emotional touchstones that I think a lot of people can relate to and see themselves in. My car was stolen from the apartment complex parking lot it was in. Because my car alarm eagerly went off all the time except for when I needed it to, I had no idea it was taken until I went to go grocery shopping and saw my spot empty. Having a car stolen is one of those things which creates an absence that doesn't seem real, where you stare out of space and something familiar you lived in and try to will the familiar thing back to you. I filed a police report. Two nights later, a friend called me and told me to turn on the news, and on the TV, there was my car, flipped upside down on I-270, surrounded by flashing lights of police cars. It turned out the person who stole my car got into a high-speed chase with police once they spotted him in it, but he made the mistake of thinking he could get out of the city by getting on I-270, which was the closest freeway entrance. I never figured out how long the chase lasted, but I imagined long enough for the culprit to realize that the freeway would only take him in a circle, and in a panic, he attempted to swerve off of an exit ramp to avoid a car, and my car flipped over and rolled three times. And with the car upside down, the airbag deployed, trapping the car's thief's neck around the spiral of the automatic seatbelt, which had tightened due to impact. And while police officers drew their guns and cautiously approached my car, he was strangled to death. That's the thing about something holding you so close that it actually becomes a part of your body. You can forget about it until it consumes you entirely. Sometimes it's our saviors that do us in. The thing about being in love with someone who does not live where you live is that the two of you have to think of new and inventive ways to see each other, sometimes based around a shared hectic travel schedule. And so, through the winding roads of New Hampshire, cloaked by ice, I am driving to a place where someone I love is in this moment because I could afford the few days off, even if they skip by quicker than I'd like. And on the way, there are several churches, all of their signs offering advice or statements. To be almost saved is to be totally lost, or start your week in the arms of the Lord. Or the last one, don't worry about the things you have no control over. And God, if you are listening, I do worry. God, if you are listening, I count the miles between my body and the body of the person I love, and I worry about each of them. God, I worry about the planes we take to each other in the sky that might not hold them. God, I wear seat belts and visit the graves of my friends in the, king, in the spring to kick the dirt from winter away. God, it is just us talking now, and I worry about everything I can't control. God, can you tell me how much longer I'll get to be alive and in love? God, I am sorry for the times I did not want to stick around. God, there is a scroll of things I have taken for granted in order to survive this long, and it is endless, and it is maybe too late to want to live forever after everything I've seen and done. But there are three ways between me and the person I love, God, and I don't have enough time to travel all of them, and I worry about every part. I worry that I can't bend them all into a giant circle from where I begin to where she begins. God, I don't know what I believe in except the shrinking of distance. God, do you worry about the things you can control? I am enough in love to worry about everything that might cast a shadow over it. God, I have touched the living face of a person I love with the same hands that I have touched the dying face of a person I love, and none of that seems fair anymore. God, I am enough in love that I want to make everything about it an endless circle with a sunset at the top of every hour, and I know this is all too much, but as long as you're not tired yet of talking, it helps. Julian Baker sings the last lines of Hurt Less with nothing but a faint piano, growing fainter as she squeezes each syllable for all it's worth. This year, I've started wearing safety belts when I'm driving, because when I'm with you, I don't have to think about myself, and that hurts less. And that's the thing about something holding you so close that it actually becomes a part of your body. Thank you. So for you as a journalist, 
does it stop for you when you become a poet, or is it all a continuum? Oh, it all feels, I don't, yeah, I, I think the genre exists largely as a, um, at least for me, as a, uh, as a roadblock to me unraveling what I want to unravel, right? I think because I write in different mediums, I just imagine that I owe my best writing to whatever I'm attempting, right? Um, and sometimes I, I think that means that I have to figure out what I'm most wrong about and how I can get to the heart of why I'm wrong about it and not need an answer at the end. And so any genre that does that is useful. This is about Michael Jackson and Whitney Houston, but mostly it's about black people showing each other affection in public. There is a picture of Michael Jackson kissing Whitney Houston on the cheek, and in the picture, Whitney is all teeth, the way she was at the end of the 80s, the way she was in a white dress as wide as heaven's door at the Grammys, where she could not dance in those heels, but still sang a song about dancing. And in the picture, Michael is about six years removed from having his daddy's nose. And what better way to sever ourselves from the sins of the father than to rebuild the temple? And the kiss in the picture is gentle, the way it might be for an old friend or a lover or two kin leaning for a moment out of the damned American engine of pop music again at their backs and howling for them to shake their skin to the ground and sing the hits. And in the picture, Whitney and Michael are under a tree and on a bridge somewhere south. And it is easy to imagine a song in the leaves. And it is easy to imagine a song in the water beneath them which once perhaps ran through a preacher's hands or over a baby's head. And history repeating itself would not be so bad if not for the chorus of violences accumulating along the landscapes where small miracles sometimes took place. And in the picture, both of their eyes are closed and I wish for a home in that darkness, a small and black eternity. It is likely true that we only get one livable youth and I wasted mine thinking myself beautiful and throwing rent money into jukes and scrawling my phone number on skin in summer and watching it sweat off outside at Goodale Park where we just had to dance to the song we all knew and performing self-worship as survival and giving myself unkillable over to a parade of death instruments and racking up just enough sins to make praying worth the time and leaving socks tangled in bed sheets and sneaking out of a room before sunlight ruptured its silence and locking arms with a motley crew of hooligans in the drunken hours and shoving five bodies into the back seats of cabs and opening the doors and sprinting down Livingston when it came time to pay the driver while he cursed the name of our families, a small penance for keeping the cash we'd spend on pills we'd never be bold enough to take. And in the mirror, I would try to smile as wide as my mother, who in the early 90s would sing pop music while steam hung over her afro in the kitchen and who would crane her neck backwards to laugh like the jokes were spilling from God's own pockets. And I am telling you all of this to let you know that I too want to feel the heat with somebody. Or at worst, I want to be a child of the heat's eager production, the smoke that rises and dances thick in the air, a ghost over those who labor in our names and then become the ghosts themselves. And it's a shame, really, that our wings don't arrive until we've already raced off the cliff and met whatever waits below. And it's a shame to still have all of these living hands and barely anything left worthy of touch. The joke hiding in Thriller is that if you play anything for long enough, it can be like the dead never left. Revived, swaying in leather down another boulevard, I tell my boys that Michael was most black when he died without being able to save his land, and no one gets that joke either. It seems the nightmares about drowning have again mounted my dreaming hours and have left me gasping into the stillness before morning, and yet I still have not learned to swim. In the bath, I sit with the water just below my chin, a height that would not cushion my hunger for sleep, but the world is undoing itself, and I must tend to my vast and growing field of fears. In this new country, a nightmare is nothing but a brief rental home for the mind to ransack and leave the sleeping body unharmed. Around the porch after the cookout, the big homie says, listen, in the 80s, police were locking niggas up for putting anything to their lips and lighting a match. So it wasn't really shit to be smiling about. Then he closes the photo album on the picture of him as a boy in a single white glove. Science says that two dead stars collided once, and that's how Earth got all of its gold. And it is not vanity to cover yourself and what your people created underneath the summer's worth of southern branches. And it is not vanity to grow weary of telling the world you cannot be with, and it is not vanity to cloak your casket in excess and have the people who love you bear the weight of your excess for one last time, and I imagine it as a question of comfort, heaven as the only chart worth topping. And it turns out that I want all pictures of me loving my people to be in color. 
I want the sunlight whistling its way across our faces to be always amber and never an absent hue that might mistake our lineage for something safe, but I am talking of artifacts again and not of how I cut my hands to the chins of those I love and kiss them on their faces. And this type of love will surely be the death of us all. This type of love will surely shake the angels loose and send them running for their horns. Thank you. As the program reached its conclusion, the stage was turned over to the Riverview Gardens High School Band, offering a nod to the future of this vibrant arts scene. And for our conclusion, some final thoughts from the artists that made this Not So Late Night a very special event. Yeah, I mean, I, I think poetry and music offer a real outlet for me to, to work through things that otherwise would be rattling around in my brain for, you know, days or months on end. I think I'm inspired to write by, um, by songs and, and by, you know, diving deep into music and trying to find a way to unravel the things I love and express them to a world of people who don't love the things I love. For me, as a younger person in the scene, I feel it's important right now that we completely step up to the mat um, to not only represent for ourselves in this, is this more contemporary time, but to also pull our elders and our history with us um, because that's, that's where it all starts. With all the crazy things and um, events that are going on in St. Louis, like we want to show people, all the people that live here, people that live around St. Louis, like there is a, a positivity, like a positive environment here. There is a, a movement going on to better St. Louis. Oh, I think uh, a message I would have to others about, about poetry and music is to, is to like, if you want to pursue it, um, don't worry about how good it is, worry about how well it's serving you.